And now tonight, we have him here. And so, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a rousing Seattle welcome to a brave American patriot, Christopher Malin. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. No, I got this one. I have this one. Yeah. So the sound is working fine? Great. Good evening. Thank, thank you to Jerry and Matt and, and Ben um, for arranging this on such short notice. And this was put together very quickly, so um, we haven't got a lot of press, so we don't have a big crowd. But that doesn't matter. The important people are here tonight, the ones that you are. Um, I just want to start by introducing the book that I have here. Um, I have a few copies of my book. It's called Solving 9-11, The Deception That Changed the World. Is that me? The Deception That Changed the World. Okay. Um, and uh, this, is the, this is the main book. This presents my thesis, my research, and where my research differs from most 9-11 books is that I discuss who is behind 9-11. Not so much, I don't get into the details of, of the various arguments and uh, this versus that. But the evidence is here and, I, and I, I show the network of people who were involved in the planning of 9-11, the carrying out of 9-11, then the um, non-investigation of 9-11, and then the promotion of the false myth on the American people. And that's why, this, that's why I have this image on the front, front of the book. It's the United States and Canada in North America, basically in the darkness. And I'm trying, this book and my information is trying to shine light to disabuse the American people of what really happened in 9-11 because to this day, 13 years now, we have been living under a deception. And a nation that is deceived to that, to that level is a nation that's enslaved. You know, we, we are, we're, we're, we're engaging in more and more wars now. We're increasing the, uh, the military action in Syria, in Iraq, everywhere. Um, this book is the thesis in a concise form, easily read, 360 pages. There's a companion book to this one, which is a little bit larger. That's called the same title, same Library of Congress number, different subtitle. That's called Solving 9-11, The Original Articles. And it's the same thickness, but a larger format. And that book contains all of my articles that I've written about 9-11 um, from September 2001 through April of 2012. And that's about 135 articles that I wrote as a journalist about the investigation, about 9-11. About and in that book, if you, if you read that, this in chronological order. If you read those articles in chronological order, you will understand all of the, all of the details and all the information upon which this thesis is constructed. So those are, those are the two books. And then I also have a book from a colleague in Santa Barbara, California. His name is Jeff Gates. This book is called Guilt by Association, How Deception and Self-Deceit Took America to War. And this book is a very good companion book to my work because I'll just read what it says on the back here, the first couple of paragraphs, so you get an understanding of what this book is about. He says, guilt by association makes treason transparent. The corruption that plagues American politics is traced to an alliance with elites and extremists loyal to the land of Israel. Unable to rid politics of campaign finance corruption, the U.S. finds its, its secu security imperiled by those skilled at deceiving America into waging wars for the Zionist state. Tracing this corruption to criminal syndicates from the 1920s, guilt by association re reveals how those skilled at displacing facts with beliefs wield clout from the shadows. Both deception and self-deceit play critical roles in enabling, enabling this criminality to expand its reach on a global scale. And this particular book was written in 2008, and it, it deals a lot with the election in 2008 between Obama and John McCain. And a, these guys wrote this book in, in Arizona. It has a lot to do with John McCain's criminality, which is very important to understanding. You know, John McCain is the leading supporter in Congress for the Zionist war agenda, I call it. 
And he is, he's the one who's been pushing, pushing for the United States to get involved in more deeply in Syria. You know, now that, now that Obama is, is waging war in Syria, you can thank John McCain for being the, 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 the firebrand that's been pushing that. Okay. Now, a little, just a little bit about me, you heard in the introduction, is that um, I've been studying the Middle East, Israel and Palestine for, oh, many years, almost, almost 40 years now. And I, I went there the first time when I was 18 years old. I was, after high school in Chicago, I traveled, I was going on the road to India, as we did in those days. And I was in, Af I was in um, Iran, in the middle of winter, in Tehran, <clears throat> and I, it was very cold, and I didn't feel like going to Afghanistan in the middle of winter. And I heard that you could go down to Israel and pick oranges on a kibbutz. So I, that sounded to me a little bit better than the snow in Tehran. So I went back through Turkey and Syria and Jordan, crossed the, crossed the bridge into, into, into Jericho, and went to the Jordan Valley. As an 18-year-old, just out of high school, and then I started living on this kibbutz and um, you know, experiencing the Zionist reality. And this was a, one of the old kibbutzim in Israel, in the Jordan Valley, by the Sea of Galilee. And these are the original kibbutzim in Israel. Deganya, Deganya Aleph and Bet, Afakim. I was an Afakim. And the people that created that kibbutz were mostly from Eastern Europe. They were old Lithuanian Jews, Polish Jews, Russian Jews. Um, very, very, very saturated in the whole Zionist propaganda. And it was interesting to see that when I would go to the, my girlfriend's grandmother's house on a Sabbath and, and sit at the coffee table, they would have books on the coffee table about Israeli history. But when you looked at them, you could see that it was, it was so blatantly propaganda. It was completely propaganda. And I realized then that the, the, the depth of the propaganda and the way that the Israelis themselves have been deceived about what Israel is all about. But of course, with the younger kids, you get a lot of give and take. And I used to sit around and argue on the kibbutz about the pluses and minuses of Zionism and how they were treating the Palestinian people. And uh, I had a lot of experience, you know, back and forth between Israel and Sweden. I lived in, in Norway in the wintertime. And I would ride my bike down to Israel in the summertime, work on the kibbutz as a lifeguard, go back to, to Norway in the wintertime. And when I was in, back in Norway, I studied Zionist history. I read books like The Thirteenth Tribe and books about what, what had happened in Palestine in 48. And so by the time I was 19 in Norway, I realized that this conflict, this Israeli-Palestinian conflict, is really the central conflict of our time. It's, it's not a conflict that can be easily resolved. It's not something that's going to be resolved by some adjustment of territorial borders, because it's, it's like a zero-sum game. The, the Israelis want it all. The, Palest the Palestinians get nothing. It's um, the party that's in power in Israel today is basically the Likud coalition. And this is the coalition of people that this coalition was created and came to power when I was living in Israel. In, the, in 1976 and 77. And I remember that when they won the election, my, my Israeli girlfriend, she was very sad. She was crying and saying that she was a labor kibbutznik. She said, this is the day that Israel died because the terrorists have taken power. The terrorists have come to power. And I didn't really know what she meant by that because my, my uh, understanding of Zionist history wasn't so good as it is today. But what happened in 1977, 77, was that Menachem Begin and Yitzhak Shamir, the former heads of the Zionist terrorist gang, the Irgun, and the, and the, and the uh, Lehi, the Stern gang. These two parties had created a coalition of all their former terrorist buddies. And, and Netanyahu is in there, um, the revisionist Zionists. They came to power in Israel. And this is when, this is when the plan for 9-11 began. The plan for 9-11 was in, in the works right away because this party that came to power, the Likud party, as I said, was the party of the terrorists. And they used terrorism as a strategic tool to achieve their goals. And what they wanted to achieve is that Israel has no hinterland. Israel is a thin sliver on the sea. 
There, there, there's, there's, no, there's no hinterland for them. So what they needed is that they needed the, United States, the United, needed the United States military to come in and to basically fight their wars for them and to give them a buffer zone. And you, you can see that first happening, for example, in 1982. When, when the Israelis invaded Lebanon, they went up to the Latani River, they, they had secured southern Lebanon, and they desired, they intended to keep that area. But, um, and the United States and the French and the Italians were called to keep, to hold the line. You remember that. And then, of course, we had the bombing of the, the barracks in, uh, in the airport in Beirut, and uh, hundreds of Americans were killed, and about 100 Frenchmen were killed, and Ronald Reagan pulled the troops out. But that was the first time that Menachem Begin and his cronies tried to get the United States to, to provide a buffer zone for Israel. Well, it didn't work out very well, so, you know, the, of course, the Israelis, because the Israelis cannot hold that territory. They, 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 can't, they can't hold that much land, so they need the United States to do it. So this was the, the plan in the 1970s. This, in, in 1979, the head of the, the, head of the uh, Mossad, the, the man who founded the Mossad, his name is Iser Harel, he told an American visiting um, minister, who is a Zionist, that is, Arab terrorism will come to the United States, he said. And when it does, they will bomb your tallest building in New York City, because that's a fertility symbol. Now this he said in 1979 to Michael Evans from Texas. And you have to ask yourself, well, how did, how did the head of the Mossad know that the Arabs planned to bomb the tallest building in New York City? I mean, where, where did he get that information from? This is the first inc inc inclination that, that we have that the Mossad was actually designing a plot to attack the World Trade Center and blame it on the Arabs. And this is exactly what happened. In my book, you, if you, when you read The uh, Deception Changed the World, you'll see that from that first articulation of the plan in 1979 by the former head of the Mossad, Isar Harel, through to the preparation of the, of, the, of the plan, to the carrying out of the plan, to the covering up of the crime, and the, and the foisting of the deception on the American public, at every single point, at every, every single point where a decision had to be made to advance this lie, there was either an Israeli agent or an American Zionist who was beholden to the state of Israel. And right now, we are at a very critical juncture. There should be more people here in this, in this church tonight to hear this because our nation is facing um, a very serious problem now because Obama has given up his neutrality and is going into the war to advance the Zionist agenda. By, by getting involved in, the, in the, the war in Syria, by his uh, bombing of Iraq, by bringing troops and, and, and building a coalition, he's, br he's bringing phase two of this war, or phase three. When you think about the Iraq war, you have to consider that phase one was in 1991. Phase two was the Clinton bombing campaign that went on for years. And then phase three was the occupation that George Bush Jr. started in 2003. So the war in Iraq has been going on now for, what is that, 23 years. And we're looking at a, a war, as they promised, that will go on for decades and decades and decades. But the thing is that we have been, we have been utterly deceived about the reason for this war. You know, it's like we, we see some videos, it's like wag the dog. We see some videos of some journalists apparently being beheaded. And these, these videos have been presented to us by an Israeli website. It's, it comes from a group called Site Intelligence Group, which is run by an Israeli Mossad agent. Her name is Rita Katz. And, and she, she was on CNN the other day. She uh, was explaining that one of the beheading videos, the most recent beheading video, she said, we put up, we put up on the website, on the internet, before the group even released it, she said, because we had it beforehand. So you have to ask yourself, how did this little Israeli intelligence group have a copy of the, of the beheading video that the group itself had not even, that the bad guys had not even posted on their own website yet, had not even issued yet? How did the Israeli website already have a copy of this beheading video? You know, I submit, you know, that most likely this, this is, uh, th these beheading videos have been created by Israeli intelligence 
for the purpose of, of getting the Americans fired up and ready to go to war. You know, the gas attack last summer, last year didn't work, but now this time it's worked. And so now we have, you know, uh, the United States going further into this Israeli agenda. Now, what is the Israeli agenda for Syria? What, is it? what do the Israelis want to accomplish in Iraq? They basically want to accomplish what they did in Yugoslavia, balkanization. They want to cut Iraq into three pieces, partition it into a Kurdish group, a Kurdish zone in the north, a Shiite area in the south, and a Sunni area to the west. And this, this whole um, Islamic State thing is uh, just another step in that direction. Now, there's a very interesting thing about this Islamic State. You remember John McCain, who is the subject of this book, Guilt by Association. And John McCain went to Syria in May 2013. And, and he met in Syria with some of these rebels. There's photographs of him sitting there talking to these rebels. And in one, one photograph in particular, he's sitting there talking to these people in a sit-down meeting. And he's talking to a man in a black shirt. And that man in the black shirt is Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who is now today the caliph of Islamic State. And this man had created Islamic State in Syria, ISIS, one month prior to this meeting with John McCain. And at the time that he met John McCain in May 2013, there was already a $10 million arrest warrant for this man put out by the U.S. State Department. So this identity, the, the identification of this guy in the black shirt came up about a month ago when Terry Massan, who lives in Damascus, published this on Voltaire.net. So I said, this is very interesting. So I contacted John McCain's office to find out what they could tell me about who this man was. And uh, I got to John McCain's uh, head spokesperson, and I said <clears throat> that Terry Massan says that this man in the black shirt sitting in the front left speaking with John McCain is Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the caliph of Islam, the Islamic State. And I said, can you tell me, can you identify who this man is that the senator is speaking to? And they wrote back the next day and they said, this man is a fighter with al-Nusra Front. But they didn't give me a name. They just said, this man is a fighter. And I said, you, you have to understand, I wrote back, this is an inadequate answer. You're telling me that you cannot tell me the name of the person with whom John McCain is speaking? John McCain goes to the battlefield in Syria, in Aleppo, where there's a war raging between these militias and the Syrian forces. John McCain has a meeting with these guys, about a dozen of them. He's talking to one, and he doesn't know who this person is, that his staff and the CIA or whatever, FBI haven't vetted this person. We don't know who this person is. Well, the reason why they, didn't, they couldn't tell me the answer is because I wrote to them, I said, if you can't tell me who this person is, I have to assume that, that Terry Massan is right. And it looks very similar that that's, that that's the person. But because what Terry Massan has said is that these groups are like chameleons. They change, they change from day to day. You know, what Al-Nusra Front, and Al-Nusra Front is calling for an Islamic, Islamic caliphate as well. So what is the difference? The difference between, you know, Islamic State and Al-Nusra Front is, is really nothing. And now we're told, our government tells us they're gonna, they're gonna vet. They're gonna vet who the Syrian rebels are that they wanna support. Now how are they gonna vet the rebels? They don't even speak the language. How are, they gonna, how are they gonna know if this person is good and that person's bad and what this person could do tomorrow, what this one's person could do in a week from today? You see? So we're being led down, we're being led down a very, very dangerous path here in regards to Syria. And you notice the timing that, that Obama President Obama announced the attack on Syria at a period of time when Congress is on holiday until November. So our representatives will not have any chance to make any discussion on this until, December, until November, which means that Obama has basically a 50-day period of bombing, bombing away. And uh, you know, I, I, I don't know what's gonna happen. But we saw, we saw something very strange in July. We saw the Israelis committing a, a very evil act of aggression in Gaza. And, you know, I, when they first started, I thought, well, they'll do it for maybe for two weeks or so. But it went on and on and on. It went on for like 50 days. And that's a great expense to the Israelis. But what, what they did was absolutely criminal. 
they, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but they used Palestinian kids as human shields. They bombed schools. They bombed at least seven schools. 85% of the targets that they struck in their bombing raids were, school, were, were personal homes, family homes. 85% of the bombing targets were family homes. Um, and there's, they, they, there's videos showing how they even attacked ambulances. There was a scene where there's three ambulances come to a, a place where there's been a bombing attack. And these three ambulances come, Palestinian ambulances come up there. And the people are all gathering around. And then the Israeli military strikes the ambulances, blows them to smithereens, and all the people are just all bloody and everything. It's really awful. But this is not new. The Israelis have been attacking ambulances since 1982. If you're interested to know really what happened in Lebanon in 1982, I recommend getting a book. It's a, a photographic book. It's called Eyewitness Lebanon. Very hard to find, large format book of photographs of Lebanon, the Lebanon war with captions. These photographs were never published. But it shows, for example, how in, in the Lebanon campaign when, in 82, the Israelis also arrested all the doctors and nurses, and they paraded them down the street. They, uh, they took them away. They arrested them. You see, this is, this is something that you, you know, a Christian or an American can't understand. Why would the invading force arrest the doctors and nurses? Because they want to maximize casualties. This is something that, that Americans can't even fathom. It's so, it's so foreign to our way of thinking. But this is how Israelis think. You think, why would you, you know, why would you strike an ambulance? That's a war crime. Why would you strike an ambulance that's gone to rescue somebody? That's what the Israelis do. And when the Israelis did this now, and with, with so many people having these digital cameras and being able to make videos and put them online, it came to the knowledge of the American people in July of this year how brutal and how criminal the Israeli state really is. Uh, this, this is something that doesn't happen very often. You know, it happens every couple years. They do something really terrible. Like the last time they did something really terrible was, well, I guess in 2012 they bombed Gaza. But in 2008, Operation Cast Lead, if you remember that, when, when George Bush was just leaving office and, 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 and Obama was just coming in, they bombed Gaza relentlessly, killed thousands of people. But one of the things they did that was most outrageous is that they dropped white phosphorus on people. White phosphorus is a burning thing that when it, when it hits your skin, it'll just keep burning through until it gets through the bone. It'll just, it just doesn't stop burning. It's a hideous, hideous thing. And of course, they were found guilty of war crimes. And uh, Judge Goldstone from South Africa did a United Nations survey, a, a study of the crimes that Israel committed, and found that Israel had indeed committed serious war crimes. But now we could see just two months ago, the Israelis doing this horrible, horrible criminal action, which is really genocide. It's a genocidal crime against the people of Palestine, against the people of Gaza Strip. And, and now we have September 11th. So some people who are familiar with my thesis could say, well, maybe Mr. Bolin isn't far off on his analysis. You know, if, they can do, if the Israelis can do that in Gaza, well, why wouldn't they do that in New York? You see, the thing is that most American people have lived, have lived under a great illusion about what Israel is. When I came back to this country after three years living in the Middle East, when I was 21 years old, I saw that, that, the, that the, the media was completely distorting the, the perception of what was happening in Israel. So then I, when I, read, I would read the New York Times and the Wall Street, uh, not the Wall Street, the uh, Washington Post. I would look for how they were twisting it and how they were distorting the reality and what information they were leaving out. Because that's the important stuff. And that's how I've been reading the papers ever since, as a, as a skeptic looking for how the Israeli, Israel was being protected. And I followed a, a number of their crimes and, and other crimes, you know, cover-ups like the shooting down of Flight 800, TWA Flight 800 in 1996, the sinking of Estonia ship in, in 1994, in which 1,000 people went to the bottom of the ocean. Um, in that sinking, there's an Israeli involvement as well. And yet the government of Sweden covered it up, the death of 502 Swedish people and many, you know, hundreds of other people, that was covered up. And this is the kind of thing that I, this is the kind of uh, studies that I was doing how governments cover up atrocities like that, especially when Israel's involved. And then 9-11 happened. And when 9-11 happened, there was 
on the very first day, there was indications that, that Israel was involved, that Israel had prior knowledge. The, f the first indication was, of course, the five dancing Israelis. These five Israeli agents who were seen clapping, videotaping, high-fiving, and clicking lighters with the burning towers behind them. They were on the Jersey side of Hudson, Hudson River. And these men were, on, on September 11th, when we were in Pennsylvania already driving home, I heard Ted Koppel came on the radio and said that the FBI is looking for five Middle Eastern men who were seen observing and videotaping and, and celebrating the world, attacks on the World Trade Center. And uh, I thought, well, they, they might be Israelis, Middle Eastern, could be Israelis. And it turned out the next day, it, they were Israelis. They were captured by the FBI. First by the New Jersey police caught them. And then they were turned over to the FBI. But these five men turned out to be Israeli intelligence operatives. Two of them were known to law enforcement as being Israeli Mossad agents, the Kurtzberg brothers. The other three were operatives. They all pretended to be moving, man, moving agents. They all were like working for this dodgy Mossad front known as Urban Moving Systems in Weehawken, New Jersey. Then there was the question of the 4,000 Israelis who were supposed to be at work that day at the World Trade Center that didn't show up. There, I think there were three Israelis who died, like one janitor and some other guys. Three people total died, Israelis, when there should have been 4,000 people there. And there was a story that came out shortly after 9-11 about this Israeli instant messaging service that could convey a message to somebody, instant message, through various platforms, through your Blackberry, through your pager, through your internet, through your whatever, your cell phone. If you, if you were in, if you were an Odigo subscriber, and the message was obviously sent in Hebrew, and probably they checked the buddy key, send this message to all people who speak Hebrew and who, well the obvious message was in Hebrew, and to Israeli nationals. So these people all got a warning message. And the interesting thing is, is the FBI went over there and met with the president of the company Odigo in Tel Aviv because he said that people in Israel had gotten this message, that something was gonna happen to the World Trade Center, and Alex Diamandis, the vice president of the company, said that the warning was precise to the minute. So that meant that the warning said, do not go to the World Trade Center today because at 8.45, something awful is gonna happen. You don't wanna be there. And this story about the 4,000 Israelis, when it came out, these people on the internet would say, oh, it's Arab propaganda, this is Palestinian propaganda, la la. No, it was nothing to do with Arab propaganda. They reported it, of course, because they saw it too. But the source of this was the Israeli foreign ministry who had received calls from 4,000 families asking about their loved ones. And then that report, they reported that to the Jerusalem Post, and the Jerusalem Post put it on their online edition on September 12th. 11th or 12th, I think on the 12th, must have been the 12th. And the, the editor of the Jerusalem Post later said that it's absolutely true. Everything that we posted on that piece is correct. So these two, these two stories, the Odigo instant message, messages and the five dancing Israelis, indicated to me that we were dealing with uh, in, in a case where Israel clearly had prior knowledge but prior knowledge in such an attack means complicity. When you have that kind of prior knowledge that something's gonna happen, you're involved, you're, you're mixed into it. So, I, you know, it was a pretty, it was a, even for me, it was a pretty, uh, you know, far out, or not far out, but it was pretty, pretty heavy, pretty heavy thing. So I wrote about it very carefully in the, in the beginning, and I continued doing my research, and, and I found, connection after connection after connection. And then at, within a couple of years, I realized that, that I had pinned the tail on the donkey. That the, this whole thing had been a, a, basically an Israeli project that the, that the Zionist Likud had started back in 1977. And they had wanted to do it earlier. They had wanted to do it back in the 80s. But they had been, they had been stymied by a, a contract. They tried to get the contract for the World Trade Center but two, two Mossad agents, um, Shalom Bendor and, and Avi um, Zvi Malkin. These are the guys that kidnapped, kidnapped Eichmann from Argentina. These are old, old Mossadniks. These are old guys. 
They're from the beginning. And that's who you find at the architectural level of 9-11. You find guys who are now in their 80s and 90s. These are the guys that dreamed up this whole plan. And the idea of the plan is, as I said, is to bring the United States in, into what's called the Israeli War on Terror, and that we, the United States, will provide for Israel this sec security cordon, this, this security buffer zone, that they can live in peace, in their peace, on their piece of land. And the Americans will take out their enemies. And this is a, this is a, a theory, this is not a theory, this is a, a, a project that Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu, was pushing in 1979 same year that, that the guy talked about the World Trade Center being attacked. He had a Jerusalem conference, and the Netanyahu Institute is created by Benjamin Netanyahu and his father, his late father, Benzion Netanyahu, born in Milikovsky in Warsaw. And they called this conference, and they, George Bush, Papa Bush was there, and a lot of American leaders were there. And that's where they first put out this idea that the United States and the Western democracies will have to come to the Middle East and fight terrorism, that is, the terrorists that are attacking Israel, and the countries that support them. And that's where we are today. So, with that, having said that, I'd like to, if anybody has any questions, I mean, this is the, a good time for you to ask questions, because um, I've, I've told you enough that you can, that you can, you can, you probably have some questions, and that's the very important give and take, you know. Does anybody have anything they'd like to ask? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Excuse me. Let's go ahead and use this, and then we'll have Christopher also repeat your question. All right. Uh, in your Solving 9-11 book, uh, there was a lot of uh, reference to materials, original materials, that I was hoping would come out sometime, your original research. Is that the stuff that's covered in the, uh, in the second book you mentioned? And yeah. we'll, we'll be able to find the original research there. Is that yeah. Correct? Yeah, that's a good question. He's asking, um, where can you find the original research, research that is uh, in, the, in the thesis Solving 9-11? And that's in the book Solving 9-11, the original articles. Those are the articles. Um, as a journalist, I wrote those with internal notes so that I, I explain where every source comes from inside the article. And it's, I started writing about this on September 11th, actually, it was September 12th. Um, and my first article was with about these 12 dancing Israelis, I think, because um, that, that story about those 12 dancing Israelis was only reported in the, in the New Jersey paper called the Bergen Record. The Bergen Record. And the, the journalist, was his name was Paolo Lima. And what's interesting about that story is that he identifies these five dancing Israelis who were, clearly had prior knowledge. He, he reports that in the New Jersey newspaper, but it was not reported in any New York newspaper. Huh? Right across the river in New York City, this, this, this story was kept out of the news. Ted Koppel had, had issued a bulletin on September 11th talking about these five Israelis, or five Middle Eastern men they were looking for. And then when they were found, nobody was interested because they turned out to be Israelis. You see, this is what we find time and time again. This is how, how you see, okay, the New York papers don't report this. That must be important. Why don't the New York papers report this when it's in the New in the, in the Jersey? I talked to Paulo Lima, and he never revisited the subject either. He, it, was, it was like he was probably told by his editors, let's not write about this anymore. Similar with the BBC. There was a BBC reporter who was at the South Tower that day, and, and just after the bombs, went, after the buildings were struck, and he, he was on the news in Britain, on, on BBC World Television, and they asked him, what did you experience? He said, that series of explosions that I felt, we can only guess at the human damage that was caused by the, those series of explosions. And all he wanted to talk about was the series of explosions that he had experienced at the South Tower. And that's all he talked about on the first day. And he never talked about it again. And he still works for BBC. You see? This is the thing. And, and, and we, so that we, we have lots of evidence of explosions, eyewitness evidence of explosions, lots of evidence of Israeli involvement, but our media doesn't cover that. For 13 years now. So we're living in a nation where our government and media have protected the deception for 13 years because they are, they are riding on that pack of lies, but that pack of lies can't go any further. <laughs> the legs, the legs on, the, on that pack of lies are broken. 
So we are, this nation is in a very unstable position. It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable for, for um, the government to, to be uh, making policies based on, on lies when you have like more than half the nation knowing that. There's a small group here today, but, but there are more than half the people in the United States know that the official version is not true. Well, how sustainable is that? Another question? Back there. Oh. I wanted to uh, get in a word here. We're going to pass this around and hope to collect a little bit of money to support this. Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, it's travel expenses. Okay. We traveled all the way from Sweden to be yeah. there. Yeah, that's and, right. Uh, so I'll nice to be in Ballard. It's, it feels like Sweden. It feels like Norway. <laughs> Question? I, I keep wanting to find a brain, you know, the Zionist brain. You got us close with the, the what do you call it, the Mossadniks that are really old, that designed yeah, it yeah. and architected it. But it, it seems so diffuse. Who is really masterminding this, or what little cabal is masterminding it? Okay. Because our government changes. It's not right. the same people, so right. how do they do it? Okay, that's a very good question. His question is, Who's at the top of this Zionist cabal that pulls this off? And this is a very, a very good question because there's, there's two things you have to remember. In my, in my opinion, the state of Israel is very powerful and they have a lot of military know-how and they have a lot of strategic know-how. But they also have a very big hinterland in the city of London, the city of New York, the city of Montreal, the city of Miami, they have their, the world, the, the international Zionist um, network. network, thank you. For example, the International Order of B'nai B'rith. Uh, just, for, just for your information, the man who made Obama president was uh, Philip Morris Klutznik in 1992. His daughter, Betty Lou Saltzman, in 1992 said, Barack Obama will be America's first American black, first black president. And that's what he became. And in 1992, Betty Lou Saltzman Klutznik, she's the daughter of Philip Morris Klutznik, who was the, in, the president of the International Order B'nai B'rith, which is a, a Zionist Freemasonic organization. So when you talk about these, who's at the top? Well, which agency are you talking about? When you're talking about the International Order of B'nai B'rith, which is international, secret, and Zionist, only open to Jews who are Zionist, you had Philip Morris Klutznik at the very top back in the 80s. But then when you talk about the Israeli planning, so the Israelis are more like the, the state and the operational arm. It's like the spear point of international Zionism. You know, you have the Rothschilds, and you have the people in, in London, and you have the, the British establishment, the British Zionist establishment. You have the people in Chicago, you have all these people. But the Israelis are like the focused power, the obvious power of that Zionist network. You see what I'm saying? There, we have people, key to this whole thing would be certainly Shimon Peres. Shimon Peres would be at very close to the top. Um, Ariel Sharon, to some degree, but he had tea with Mr. Perez and then he had a coma shortly afterwards. Um, I think he was probably perhaps thrown into a coma. But then you have uh, Ehud Barak, he's near the top. Then you have a lot of people whose names wouldn't mean anything to you because these are the heads of the Mossad, the heads of the Israeli intelligence, and there's many of them. But political leaders, you, you, can, you can see those guys. and. Um, Ehud Olmert, for example. Ehud Olmert was in New York City on September 11th. That's very strange. I found that in the, in the, in the reading the Jerusalem Post sports page in an article about how he had been in New York City on September 10th transacting a deal selling an Israeli football club, the Likud football club called Betar, to a couple Israeli guys in New York City. That transaction occurred on September 10th, 2001 in New York City. The night before, he had been in Toronto at a, at a United Jewish Appeal fundraiser. Well, what's most peculiar about this Ehud Olmer's visit to New York City is that he was the, he was the mayor at that time of the sister city of New York City, which is Jerusalem. He was also deputy prime minister of Israel. But his, his, visit, to, to, his visit to New York City was kept completely secret. 
you know, certainly the FBI knew he was there, the U.S. government knew he was there, the, the uh, Giuliani knew he was there, New York police knew he was there, the media knew he was there, but nobody reported it. Why? And that afternoon, September 11th, a plane load, a 747LL plane, left, tele, left to Tel Aviv from New York City. The U.S. Defense Department allowed a, a plane full of Israelis to leave New York City on September 11th. So I suppose, I suppose Ehud Olmert was on that. Now, is Ehud Olmert in the top echelon of the planners? Probably is. Probably is. So these are the players. But I would say at the very top would have to be Shimon Peres today, of the people who are still alive. But there's, other, there's, there's many others. But the next question. I understand that the uh, ownership and control of the uh, newspapers, television, and radio uh, distribution in the United States is in the hands of six uh, consolidated companies that own all these papers and, and stations, networks. And I also understand that uh, many of the men who are at the uh, CEOs and boards are Jewish. Do you have any knowledge about what's the exact breakdown and uh, has, is this changing over time or is it a fairly constant phenomenon or? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question because the, as I said, this deception is per perpetuated and foisted on the American people primarily through the media. We are informed by the media and we are, we are deceived by the media. The media has betrayed us. We, we don't have a free press in this country. And in this deception, the 9-11 deception, the primary target is the American people. They don't care what the Palestinians think. They don't care what the Afghans think. The Afghans have no idea why we're in their country. They don't think it has anything to do with, they don't know anything about 9-11. They, they, they don't understand the connection 9-11, American troops in Kabul. That means nothing, nothing to them. In the Pakistanis, the Israelis, the deception is not aimed at them, it's at us. We are the target of this deception, which is why we are the ones who have to understand the deception and disabuse ourselves and our friends and our neighbors. That's the only way we're going to get out of this. Because if, if, we are still, if we are still mired in the deception, then we're trapped. Then we're trapped. We, 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 we will not be able to figure our way out as individuals, as communities, or as a nation. You know, it, and, and, and the thing is, what, about the ownership of the media, I met Rupert Murdoch once. I skied his family down from the mountain in Aspen. I talked to him when he was just coming to this country and when he had just acquired the Chicago Sun-Times. And I asked, I talked to him a little bit and skied with his kids. And my question was, my, how does an Australian publisher of some little newspapers in Australia acquire the capital to come to the United States and take over hundreds of papers and, and television networks? This is what you have to understand. How this works, well, I've seen how it works in Estonia. I know the media mogul in Estonia. He is, he is made rich by an outside source in Sweden and London. This outside source has created this man, this is a Jewish man in, in, in Estonia, to own all the newspapers, all the magazines in that country. So he becomes the kingmaker. And it's the same thing with Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch is a, an Orthodox Jew from, he, he keeps that pretty hidden, but his mother was a lady named Green. She was the, an Orthodox Jew from Australia, and he was funded from the very beginning by the Rothschild Bank. So they create him, and he becomes the vessel, he becomes, the, he becomes their man in America. And so, for example, when the United States invaded Iraq, was preparing to evade Iraq in 2003, he owned 160 newspapers. And every one of his editors agreed with him about the need for American troops to go into Iraq. You see how it works? So the readers of all those newspapers in America and Canada and Britain say, yeah, I guess we should go to Iraq. Hey, that makes sense. Because most people, most Americans, aren't that savvy when they read the newspaper. They don't put their critical thinking and say, well, maybe these guys are trying to convince us of something. And so we've gone into these wars very blue-eyed, and we've been terribly, terribly abused. Our country has been wasted, plundered. They've taken trillions of dollars. They've killed thousands of, thousands of our people and many, many thousands of th those people over there. And they have taken this country one big step back. And you know, this is my first time in America in seven years, but I have never been in a country that is so militarized in my life. 
You know, it's just, it's frightful. And, but the, the media is the main, the main tool by which they, they occupy our minds, by how they deceive us. And I know also that I used to work for a little independent paper, so-called independent paper. The alternative media is also controlled. So it's not as simple as black and white. You say, well, I'm not gonna read the New York Times, but I'm gonna listen to Alex Jones. You see, you have to understand that it's not so simple. You, in the alternative media, there's a great deal of control too. So it means that you really have to be able to use your critical thinking skills and sift the wheat from the chaff. You have to tell for yourself what is true and what is not true. Because like, just for example, Gordon Duff, he's got this website called Veterans Today. A lot of people read this. But a couple years ago, and you know, just recently, he attacked me, Professor Jones, and Richard Gage of Architects and Engineers. He, he, they lumped us three together as being something called thermite sniffers or something like that. They tried to make, make us sound that, like we're lunatics, we're liars, we're, 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 we're lying to the American people. Because what really happened was a nuclear bomb went up and, and vaporized the, the mast on top of the North Tower. I said, good Lord. And so I wrote, to, I wrote to Mr. Duff and I said, Mr. Duff, this is nonsense what you write. First of all, the, the mast of the World Trade Center fell down and a big piece of it is in a museum in, in Washington, D.C. It wasn't vaporized at all. So, I mean, what are you talking about? But, but the thing is, is that if you, Mr. Duff, a couple years ago on the radio, said that something like 50%, 50% of what is on Veterans Today is, is patently false. And he said something like 30% of what I write is also false. Because if I didn't write false information, he said, I wouldn't be alive. He said that. And so, and, and it's like, so, but do, does the reader know? Does the reader know what statement is true and what statement is false? So he's, he's very honest. He, he, in that sense, he's let the reader know, you know, half of the stuff on my website is false. You figure out what's true and what's false. But for, for a reader to play that game, you know, if, if you know that somebody's giving you disinformation, just put a big D on that page and remember, that's disinformation site. But that's what I'm saying is that it's not easy. It's not easy to know what's true. I'm just a simple guy. I grew up in Chicago. I was an Eagle Scout. I was an altar boy. I had all this experience in the Middle East. And I learned a lot about Israelis because I lived there a lot. And I had an Israeli girlfriend. I married her. And I, I've worked with those people. And I saw how they operate. And, you know, I was in this kind of lucky situation that when 9-11 happened, I was very tuned in to Israeli false flag behavior. I'd seen it many times. I'd seen how they did it on the USS Liberty. I'd seen how they did it in Egypt on the Livonia Affair in the 1950s. They've done it many, many times. For example, when they blew up the, when they blew up the Marine barracks in, Baghdad, in, in Beirut, the Israelis knew exactly what truck was going to carry the bomb. They knew what truck, what truck, what color, what type, what license number, where it was coming from. They knew everything. But they only gave the Americans the skinniest information. Beware of trucks. Something like that. Huh? Beware of trucks. But they knew exactly it was a Mercedes truck, da 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 coming from Bekaa Valley. The truck came, blew up, killed 180 Americans. And you know, this is how it works. Next question, please. Well, thank, thank you for uh, your visit here. Uh, I am a member of the Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. I am uh, Ibrahim Saudi, and uh, uh, I have been interviewed actually by Jim Fetzer on his radio program, uh, I think three times so far, uh, and also with Kevin Barrett uh -huh. uh, as well. Uh, I succeeded lately in convincing Jim Fetzer to uh, uh, stop his attacks on Richard Gage and uh, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And he actually has given me a written statement mm -hmm. that he is willing to work again with Jim Fit, uh, mm -hmm. Stephen Jones mm -hmm. and uh, architects and engineers. I have that in writing, mm -hmm. actually. And Good. some people in the room here have seen it. Good. 
Uh, so I am actually willing to play the wise guy kind of thing, stranger that I'm the one with the accent and I'm the youngest member in the whole group, yeah. and then I am the one to pull the... Good. So I would like to have your pledge, please, to work with me to try to do your part, and let's not waste our energy with what Gordon Duff says. No, yeah, yeah. Let, let's play smart. We are actually now, like you said, in a very critical time in history, right. and unless we wake up, we might actually, like you Humanity might never come back right. from what's happening now, and I'm right. really worried. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, good. So I, I need your pledge in front of the people here that you will work with people like me yeah. in order to bring the splinter, the 9-11 yeah. groups, uh, uh, pilots and lawyers. and yeah, yeah. We need to come together, grow up, and, and read. Yeah, yeah. Because if we just stick to little groups, shh. Okay, I understand. I, okay. That, that's number one. That's okay. th this okay. is far more important than a okay. question. Bill. Okay, go on. And, and the other thing is, uh, one thing just about what you said that, mm. uh, that needs a little, uh, intelligence agents are supposed to be really smart and professionals, mm. yeah. And I find the Israelis dancing mm. while the event is just kind of like, you don't expect professionals to do something mm -hmm. like that. Right, right. So the, don't don't you like don't you think that this is kind of like like strange that those who are supposed to be professionals who knew your thing and then all of a sudden they are acting like no, like okay. idiots dancing. Okay, yeah. I understand. Um, about the, I'll take the second question first. Um, these guys were in a van that tested positive for explosives. When the van was stopped by the New Jersey police. The New Jersey police did a, a test in the field and the, the van tested positive for explosives. These men also carried several passports, in, of several similar passports in their socks, $5,000 tucked away, box cutters, and they, they told the police that they had been on West Avenue that morning. They had been by the World Trade Center that morning. Uh, these guys worked with a company that was clearly tied in to the logistics of 9-11. They may have put the explosives in the building. They may, have been, they may have been part of the team. Now, when they saw the building going down, they were looking at the fruits of their work. They were looking at something that they had participated in. So they said, yeah, good job, wow. They were, I think they, were, they, they didn't expect to be seen. They didn't expect that anybody would see them. It's some lady who just looked out her window from above and saw them, and she called the police. She said it, she thought it was odd, but she's the only one that called. If she hadn't been there, nobody would have called. If I hadn't written these books, nobody would be telling you about the Israeli role in 9-11. Nobody. Because there was nobody else looking, doing this research at all in 2005, 2006, when I was attacked by the police. I was the only, I was the only person who has pursued this avenue of research at all. Now you'll, you'll, you'll read many places where people repeat my findings without giving me credit. But all of this investigation that has pinned the tail on the Israeli donkey was done by me. I know, because there's nobody else. Now your first question was, oh, about this uh, Fetzer and, and this stuff. Um, you know, my basic attitude is that, um, I've told Mr. Fetzer this before, if Mr. Fetzer thinks nuclear bombs were put in the building, find a nuclear scientist, write a peer-reviewed paper, and get it published. Simple. He, he's, a, he's a professor of the history of science, he knows that's how it's done, do it. Same with Judy Wood. If Judy Wood thinks that Buck Rogers beam weapons from space or from here pulverized the towers and made everything get pulverized, write a scientific paper. Find some experts who are experts in that field, scientists, write a peer-reviewed paper and get it published in a journal. That's what, that's what Professor Jones, I work with Professor Jones on this. You know, I, I, brought the, I brought the scientific documents from California to him where we found the, we found the tiny, tiny iron, iron rich spheres in the dust. And then he found that he got, he wanted to get samples of the dust. He finally got six samples of the dust. He found in the samples of the dust, these little chips that when they were heated up to 420 degrees Celsius, went off with a bang. And the energy yield of those chips is higher than any known explosive. Now I got an email from Mr. Fetzer just today and he's still poo-pooing this whole thing about, about the energy release of nanothermite. Well, and, and when, I, when I present scientific documents, papers about the energy yield of nanothermite to Mr. Fetzer and to Mr. Duff, they say, oh, Bolin's evidence is paper thin. It's from the Department of Defense for crying out loud. 
Well, what I'm talking about is instead of us splintering ourselves because everyone has a theory of what happened, uh. let's actually focus on our agreement, which is the official story is a pilot. Of course, of course. That's what we need of to course, of course, of course, I understand. The official story, we all know the official story is, is false. And, and I agree with that. I, I have no qualms with that. But when people, when people attack me and Professor Jones and Richard Gage and call us names and say that we're fraudsters, then I have to defend myself. That's all. That's all. Next question. That man there. Thank you. Uh, Thank I you. have seen and read evidence of Israeli foreknowledge of September 11th. So grant that. But then there are a lot of other levels of complicity. Um, that's what I'd like you to address. In particular, from what I hear you speaking of now, it sounds as if you believe that Israel did the entire thing. That is, took down all the buildings, controlled the drones or the airplanes or whatever was involved without any cooperation from elites within the US government. So is that your view? Or if okay. not, would you correct or yeah. explain what your yeah. view is? And also, yeah. if you would provide evidence yeah. for yeah. The Israeli involvement beyond the level yeah. of foreknowledge. Yeah, very good. That's a very good question. He's asking um, about Israeli involvement in the 9-11 complot conspiracy, and it, does it extend further than just the prior knowledge that I've already explained? And are American elites or other elites involved in this um, wittingly? And. Uh, my research has found, as I said, in this matrix, if in, this, in this fabric of 9-11, at every critical juncture, you find an Israeli or you find a Zionist who's tied to the state of Israel. That is like the signature characteristic of 9-11 research. So what it indicates to me is that the, the whole thing was set up very elaborately, very sophisticated, over a long period of time. And, and so, but where, where it really becomes very clear, as you said, beyond the prior knowledge, is in the cover-up. For example, the, all that was left at the World Trade Center after 9-11 was basically dust and steel. This is what the guys that were picking it up said, just dust and steel. Okay, we saw the dust, we, we, we found nanothermite in the dust, we found, we found molten metal balls in the dust. That's the characteristic of the, of the World Trade Center dust. The steel, on the other hand, was the crime scene where 2,700 people were cooked alive. They, they were cooked alive in that building. That's very hard to understand or to, to fathom, but we, we, we know that's what happened because, for example, on the South Tower, where the, where the plane crashed in, about 10 minutes before the building came down, the floor broke, 80, 82nd floor broke, and, and iron, molten iron started to pour off the building at the east corner of the building. This is, it just starts pouring off the building like a cascade, just white hot molten steel, molten iron. Tons of it. Well, that steel is at least 1,200 degrees Celsius, which means that the people who were trapped above the 82nd floor were being cooked by that 1,200 degree heat, because that heat would go right up through the, the, ventil the ventilation shafts and the elevator shafts. Well, so we're looking at a place where 2,700 people were killed, 250 of them had to jump because it was so hot inside the building. But rather than treating that, rather than treating that crime scene as a crime scene, the steel was recycled quickly. It was sent to two Zionist-owned junkyards in New Jersey where the steel was cut into pieces five feet and shorter, mixed with other scrap, and sent to Asia. Mind you, this was being done at a time when the, the price of scrap, scrap steel was the lowest it had been in 50 years. And the companies, the, the, the scrap companies are paying $25 a ton to ship it to China. It makes no sense. If, the, if you would just rather hang on to the steel until the price goes up, or you would sell it to Pennsylvania foundries where your transportation costs are minuscule compared to sending it to China. This was destruction of the evidence. Who was destroying the evidence? Michael Shertoff, who was the Assistant Attorney General, later became head of Homeland Security Czar. Michael Shertoff is an Israeli-American dual national. His mother was a Mossad agent, Lavia Eisen. And, and Michael Shertoff was the person who was supposed to prosecute the crimes of 9-11 because being an act of terrorism, it falls right into his domain. 
He is the person who was supposed to prosecute the crime. Do you know that Michael Sheratoff also prosecuted the 1993 bombing as, a, as the attorney from New Jersey? So Michael Sheratoff has been involved with the 9-11 the saga from 1993. So there, that's another one of those key players. Michael Sheratoff would be one of the people who is higher than management level, he's architectural level as well. In such a false flag terrorism, terrorism attack, there are three fundamental levels. There's the architectural level, the management level, and the, and the deception, the working level. For example, the 19 terrorists, they're part of the deception. They're the working level, patsies even. Management level is the people who manage the problem afterwards uh, or, or in the process. For example, the judge, Judge, judge Heller, Hellerstein in New York City. There were 96 families that did not take the government payout. They, didn't, they wanted a trial. They wanted to know who killed their loved one. They wanted to know what happened that day. The, number, the main defendant in the 9-11 tort litigation was an Israeli company owned by one of Gilad Atzmon's cousins, Menachem Atzmon, a, cr a criminal in Israel, a Likud criminal who, who uh, went to jail. I even think he went to jail for fraud. After the, he got out of the problems in Israel, he went to, Is went to Holland and started this company, International Consultants on Targeted Security. They provide airport security around America. Their company, Huntley USA, was the company that, that let those 19 Arabs on the plane in Boston and Dulles. So they were the number one key defendant. Judge Hellerstein, though, he dismissed them. He said, well, you're just a parent company. It doesn't matter. You can go home. So what Judge Hellerstein did is as he was waging his war of attrition against those 96 families, one family at a time, settle that family, settle that family, settle that family, it turned out about a year ago or so, there was only one family left, the Bavis family from Boston. They finally settled because the 9-11 the, the litigation had been cut down so they became meaningless. They were talking about nothing anymore. That's how they work it. Judge Hellerstein, his son lives on a, on a, on a settlement on the West Bank, illegal settlement. His son's an Orthodox Jew. His son is a lawyer, and he's a lawyer for the company that, has, that, that was the defendant in, the, in his father's litigation. This is a clear conflict of interest. He's, his father is overseeing the case of the 9-11 tort litigation. The key defendant is ICTS, while the judge's son is in Israel working for that company as a lawyer. And the New York Times wouldn't touch it. But a judge, a, a lawyer in, in Southern California took up Ellen Mariani's case and took that to the District Appeals Court based on my evidence. And they denied, they denied the case being entered in, and they, they, they sanctioned Ellen Mariani and Bruce Lighty for being anti-Semitic for even bringing it up. Huh? Can I take the hard case? Yeah, please. The yeah. The he needs the microphone. Thank you. Um, I'd like to get to what seems to me a central kind of issue and who was behind it and how it was done which is, I think we're agreeing, most people in the room, I, what I hear you say is that some kind of probably nanothermite material was used to bring down the towers. Okay, and that, in part, in part. It's not the only thing. It's not the only thing. Okay, let's just, yeah, e even part. that. Right. Okay, and that had to take considerable amount of time mm -hmm. to put into the buildings. Mm -hmm. Now, my understanding is the heads of security for the Twin Towers was um, George W. Bush's cousin. Okay, okay. I'm assuming he's not Jewish. Okay. And all the work in the elevators. Okay. This seems to me, but just take that one case. Yeah. How was that done yeah. by Israel? Right. Good point. First of all, who made this nanothermite? That's the question. Where was it made? It was made in 2001. It was the kind of thing that was made at Livermore Lab and technical laboratories like in Texas and there's some places in Dresden that make it, in Germany. There's, uh, but it's, it's very complicated. It involves, it involves mixing materials and, and getting materials to line up molecule by molecule uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a gel or a, a solid gel. And it, it became a paint. It was a paint, what they were applying. Now, who had the capability to do that? Who put it in the building? Let's ask the, the basic questions first. Yes, how? First, we have, we have um, um, Larry Silverstein obtained the contract for the buildings, the, uh, the lease for 99 years. He obtained that 
on the 26th of July, 2001. At that point, he had control of the buildings. He had complete control of the buildings. Now, I've heard the Stratosec thing before. I know about the Stratosec company. But the actual operational security for the building was run by a company called Kroll & Associates, who were on the part, they're part of the AIG Marsh McLennan Group on the top floor. The first plane flew into Marsh McLennan's building. Marsh McLennan was headed by the son of Maurice Greenberg. It's one, of the, it's one of the companies of the Greenberg chain. Maurice Greenberg is the guy that owned AIG, who was bailed out for $180 billion in 2008, 2009. Maurice Greenberg, he has a big chain of companies, and Marsha McLennan was one of them. The first plane went into the computer room of Marsha McLennan. The second plane went into the computer room of Fuji Bank. Okay, so both, both planes went into, into rooms that were secure data centers. In the Fuji Bank room, we know I've spoken to both, both banks, both, both rooms. The Fuji Bank room is very interesting because <clears throat> it was a, a reinforced floor, and during the summer before 9-11, before they had been moving in big, 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 huge, heavy boxes, which they were told were batteries. And the technician who I spoke to said, you know, the weird thing is that they put, put all these heavy batteries on this reinforced floor, but the batteries are never turned on. And that's the floor that the plane went into in the South Tower. And when the plane goes into the South Tower, we see these tremendous explosions coming out the side and the front of the building where the plane has just gone in. We see incredible explosions coming back out here. And those explosions are creating a lot of white smoke and bright orange flame. That's thermate. That's thermate with an A. That's, got, that's thermite. So somebody had access to those buildings and put in these explosives in those, in, those, in those secure computer rooms. Now the secure computer rooms probably played a role. They probably were acting also as a homing device for the planes, the drones, to go right into that room. But you had to have, you had to have these, exp these explosives in the room to create the spectacle. You had to have that spectacle. Otherwise, you would just have had the propane, kerosene, the kerosene burning, excuse me, with the dark orange flame and the soot, which is what we see coming out the other end of the building. But if you look at the picture of the, of the North Tower being hit, the first building being hit, you, you, when you go home tonight, look at the pictures, the next time you have a chance, look at the plane hitting the North Tower, and you see on the, on the left side of the building, you see a huge white cloud being shot out of the building. It looks like a gigantic cotton bale like three stories high and as wide as the building, pure white. What's creating that? That is when thermite or thermate go off, when they detonate, they create white smoke and molten iron. That's what, that's what you get. And so that's not nanothermite. That's just thermate. It's used in Hollywood spectacles. So who put this in there? Who, put the, who got into the World Trade Center and spray painted or, or applied this stuff inside the elevator shafts? Who could have done that? Ask Larry Silverstein. Larry Silverstein had control of the building. And people who worked in the building, they all come up to you and tell you that like, you know, for weeks before 9-11, this whole bank of ele elevators was not being used. Was, you couldn't go use it. It was blocked off. Nobody could ride in those elevators. Well, you know, the only people who can tell us who was doing that are Larry Silverstein and people that were working with Larry Silverstein because it's his property. Now, one thing I had to tell you about when, when the Mossad does an operation like this, they want to own everything. They want to own the venue. They, everything, they, want to own everything. they have to have complete control. That's the only way they can pull off something like this because if they don't own it, something might go wrong. And like I said, in 1986, Atwell Security of Mossad by Shaul Eisenberg, they tried to get the contract for the World Trade Center. But only when they found out that Shalom Ben Dor, one of those Mossad guys, was, had, had, commit, had, mur had committed murder in Israel, did the Port Authority say, no, no, we'll tear this contract up. We won't give it to Atwell Security. Because if they had gotten the contract for security back in 1986, 1986 then 9-11 would, would have happened 1990, 1988, 1990, much earlier. So you see, th these things were interrupted. But the nanothermite worked very well. The question is how they put it in there, I don't know. I have a very interesting article in my book about the, I can't get into such detail right now, but there's a company called LVI, headed by Burton Freed. Engineering News and Report reported on the 13th of September 2001 that LVI, who does pre-demolition work for controlled demolition, they go and prepare the building. Engineering News and Report had reported that 
That company, LVI, headed by Burton Freed, had done extensive asbestos abatement work in the towers in the year prior to 9-11. I called up Burton Freed and said, Mr. Freed, can you tell me, you know, did you do this work as the engineering report says? He says, no, no, it wasn't me, it was another company. So you have to track down these people and find out who's telling the truth, who's not, who did it, did he do it? I don't know. But somebody got in there, somebody put the, the nanothermite in there, somebody put the explosive charges in the elevator shafts, somebody put the thermite in the floors. Who did it? I don't know. That, that needs to be determined. Somebody has to come forward and, and admit. Another question? Okay. I, I, I also want to respect Christopher's time and give you about 10 more minutes for questions and then about 20 minutes for book signing and okay. try to get out of here by 9. Um, I'd like to go with people that haven't asked questions. And then <clears throat> um, you say you understand the Israeli people um, and mentality. Now, my feeling is that usually it's the government that's the malicious one, not the people. I had an Israeli girlfriend too back then. Um, but uh, do you think, is there a 9-11 um, truth movement in Israel? No. Ah. That's a good question. Uh, I doubt it. I doubt it. I think that there's actually a lot of people in Israel who probably know a little bit of, some, of the truth. But the, the, the Israeli bond, um, and especially at the higher level, is such that Israelis have a kind of code of omerta. It's a Jewish thing that you never, you never say something about another Israeli or a Jew or anything about your country that can be any way be used against your country or your people by outsiders. It's like a code of omerta. And, and that's why Gilad Atzmon was speaking the other day in Seattle, and I saw him in Portland. He was giving a kind of strange lecture, but he was talking about Jewish intelligence and bell curves and things. But I, I asked him afterwards, because I really wanted to ask him, I've been meaning to ask him for a while, and I had the chance to meet him, if he was related to this Mr. Atzmon, who owns ICTS. And he was very honest. Gilad said, yes, yes. He's like my dad's cousin. And then, and then I said, and then he said, and he's also related to Nathan Yellen Moore, who was the founder of Revisionist Zionists and the Irgun Party. He's a, a, another big terrorist. And he says, and, and, and Janet Yellen is related to Yellen Moore. He says, Janet Yellen, so Janet Yellen is related to these Likud people. She's the head of the Federal Reserve, as you know. And then, for good measure, he said, also, yeah, and I'm, I'm also related to um, Zippy Livni. And that Livni is related to the Yellen family. So it's like, if, 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 if my good friend Gilad Atzmon, you know, really were serious, he wouldn't be talking about bell curves of Jewish intelligence. He'd be talking about the role of Israel in 9-11. But I'm afraid that he, he says he doesn't have too much communication with his family anymore and that they don't talk too much. But I, he should try. He should try. I have to see. No, I don't want to say something. He has a question here. No. <laughs> no. Jerry Myers! Jerry Myers! Oh, uh, 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 are you Jerry Myers? No. Oh! Uh, you look just, like... just quickly, quickly, oh. because I think uh, uh, Bert brings a good point, yeah. yeah. Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, for example, you never spoke about the Pentagon. Yeah. And the Pentagon was obviously something that uh, either the brass in the Pentagon were also compromised, mm. or the Pentagon also was made entirely by the Mossad, which but, there is no really evidence for. Do that. you have a question? Oh yeah, okay, well I, there's, I mean, I only have a short time to talk. I didn't talk about Shanksville, right? Shanksville is a huge cover-up. I didn't talk about a lot of things. But, but like, let's just, maybe just very briefly talk about Shanksville. We won't talk about the Pentagon. Shanksville is something a lot of people don't understand. You, they showed you a hole in the ground in the reclaimed mine. They say the plane went there, right? But the, the actual debris re, re, was being removed about a half a mile in the woods. All the debris was being removed in the woods. So we were, it was like an, a, a deception. We were told that the plane went here, and I went to the Somerset paper to talk to, I said I wanted to talk to the newspaper about how they covered the story, and they put me, they put me in a room with a, a U.S. military guy who, who was speaking for the newspaper. And he said that you have to understand that the, that the plane was coming so fast that when it hit the ground, the ground liquefied and the plane was swallowed. This is U.S. Army personnel telling me this. But he said, but one, one wing bounced and, and flew in the woods about a quarter mile. Okay, okay, that's what you say. And then I understood that Somerset, the Somerset newspaper just built a new building the next year for $2 million. And, 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 the, and the, when I asked the, the publisher of the paper, 
did you, did you ever report any of the eyewitnesses in town, there were at least a dozen, who reported seeing an Amer an Amer a US military plane flying around before the plane even happened, before it even hit? He said, no, no, we couldn't, we couldn't validate their story, so we didn't report that. You see, that's how they got the $2 million for the new building, by not saying anything that would offend the US military or the US government. But the thing about Shanksville, is that I found out that this debris was found, it's in the book, the debris was found around the Hoover's, camp, the Hoover's cabins in the woods. Reverend Hoover is a Lutheran minister, his son Barry Hoover lived in the woods. So I asked, I spoke to Mr. Hoover, the Reverend, and I said, Mr. Hoover, you know, the FBI told you you couldn't stay in your, you had to leave your territory, you had to leave your nine acres and, and let, let them pick up all the pieces. You said that there was luggage and human body parts everywhere. Why didn't you tell the American people that, that the plane didn't crash in that little ground, in the hole in the ground, but that the whole debris was in the woods. He said, well, I was, I was trying to cooperate. You see? What? He was trying to cooperate. Because what the FBI, I know, I know the coroner there, local coroner, in, in the state of Pennsylvania, the local coroner is the person who has complete control of any accident site. That man is Wally Miller. He's my age. And, and I talked with Wally Miller a couple times, but Wally Miller, they asked the same thing. He was paint. He was he was he was doing fixing his house too. He had a lot of he had come into a lot of money. He was getting a new funeral home all makeover, and the three guys that were painting the Angel Brothers, these boys were painting. The, they said, "Wally, tell them what the FBI told you." And he said, "Okay, okay." The FBI told him, "Wally, are you going to be a team player? Are you going to cooperate?" What that meant is, are you going to turn over the crash site to us, and let? And so they did. So the FBI took over the crash site and the removal of all the bodies, while Wally Miller stayed at, a, at a, a, a hospitality center about six miles away, meeting the families in the press. Yet, I, then I called Wally Miller a little bit after that, and I said, Wally, don't you feel badly signing death certificates for people whose bodies you never saw? He slammed down the phone. You know, he's, he's, he didn't like that. But that's what he did. Now, you see, this is a very important thing. So, why was the government hiding the fact that all the crash, the debris of Flight 93 was over there? Well, this is, this is a very important question because we, 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 Associated Press reported that Flight 93 landed in Cleveland that morning. Before it crashed, they said it landed in Cleveland. And the Associated Press issued this statement and they said that United Airlines had even identified the plane as United Flight 93. So some monkey business happened in Cleveland. So what I'm saying, what might have happened is that the planes 175 and 511 may very well have been unified as one flight, may have landed in Cleveland, and the various people, the victims, were put on one plane, which was then shot down over there in Shanksville. Because the people in Shanksville all talk about that screaming thing that went over their head and the huge explosion. So something happened in Shanksville, that, and this is like the most obvious cover-up. You know, the Shanksville is the most obvious one. The Pentagon is also very obvious. But it's one big, bloody, sordid saga. Any more questions? One thing, that lady has one. We're at time already. Okay. Because we want to give some time for book signing. So, yes. yeah, just come up and you can okay, ask some yeah. questions during the book signing. But I have a couple books here. I have, uh, the, thank you very much. Yeah, please, everyone, thank you. This is my car. Okay. Thank you for coming. Okay. 